Teach us your way, O Lord, that we may walk in your truth. Give us undivided hearts to revere your name. We give thanks to you, O Lord, our God, with our whole hearts, and we glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward us. Let us worship God this day. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, in you we live and move and have our being. You alone have been our help and guide through good times and bad. You alone give us the strength we need to face the challenges around us. You alone will be rest for our bodies and souls. To you we turn for wisdom. In your presence, we will find the peace and comfort we long for. Fill us with your spirit in this time of worship. Open our minds and hearts so that we may see as you see, love as you love, and follow your ways for the sake of Christ our Lord. God, who sees and knows our inmost thoughts and our thoughtless actions, the truth of our lives is this. We are often impetuous and do not seek your wisdom. We are often stubborn and do not practice mercy. We are often arrogant and do not act with love. We are often anxious and do not trust in you. Forgive who we have been, amend who we are, and direct who we shall be, for the sake of Christ our Lord. Friends, remember that God is slow to be angry and quick to forgive, kind and gracious to all. Know that your sins are forgiven through the grace of Jesus Christ, who has called us to give those who have sinned against us in the words that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Welcome to worship with the St. Andrew's community on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. You are welcome here, whether you are dropping in for the first time or if you've been a longtime member of our congregation. We wish you God's blessing and peace this day. We are grateful, as always, for all those participating in the service. Our soloist today is Elizabeth Forrester. Carmen Bousquet will be reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, and Ian Royer will be reading the Gospel lesson. Ian wanted a way to celebrate with the congregation and to give thanks to God for a new job that he has recently begun. He will also be doing the responses in the prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. 
As always, we thank our music director, Dan Bickle, for all the work that he does. We are now providing two takeout breakfasts per week on Tuesdays and Fridays as part of our Out of the Cold program. Of course, people who are coming in now are not coming in from out of the cold, but the world can be a very cold place even in the middle of the summer for many of the most vulnerable people in our community. We're grateful to the volunteers who are making this program work, even with the added requirements for health and safety at this time. Stay tuned at the end of the service for the Summer Challenge. Shara Benavides, our Coordinator of Faith Formation for Children and Youth, has designed these challenges for families of all types on the themes of creation and community. We hope that you will take up at least one of these challenges over the course of the summer. Shara would uh, like to have your pictures and your feedback. If you would like to make a financial contribution to the work and witness of St. Andrews, there will be information on how to do so at the end of the service. You can also find this information and lots more about St. Andrews on our website at standrewstoronto.org. Let us pray. God of wisdom, your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways are not our ways. As we listen to the scriptures, stir our hearts and minds with the Holy Spirit so that we understand your desire for the world and resolve to do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again this week, we read from the book of the prophet Isaiah. This reading is taken from the second part of Isaiah, which emerged out of the experience of the people of Judah in exile in Babylon in the 6th century BC. The words affirm that God is one and unique and powerful. For people living in captivity and being constantly reminded of the power of the Babylonian gods and kings, this offered hope and a reason to look to a future of freedom and peace again. We will hear a paraphrase of Psalm 139, sung in the words of hymn 101. One of the most well-known psalms, it assures those hearing it that God is with us and was with us even before we were born. There is nowhere that God is not present and nowhere that we can flee from God. God is present throughout time and space, and we can take comfort that God is always there to hold and protect us, even in the most difficult of times. The Gospel reading from Matthew is another agricultural parable. Like the parable of the sower that we read last week, this parable of the wheat and the weeds, or as it is in the King James Version, the wheat and the tares, is told by Jesus as he teaches the people from a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Also, similarly to the previous parable, Jesus later offers his disciples an interpretation of this parable. It picks up a theme that can be found throughout Matthew's Gospel, about the division of people in relation to the kingdom and that some will be judged harshly for their lack of or negative response to its coming in Jesus.
reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44, verses 6 to 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declare it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who has sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and they went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will send the reapers. Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached them saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one and the enemy who has sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you think about the weeders in the parable we heard read today? I have to admit, I've had a hard time with them. Something just doesn't seem right. 
someone had mysteriously come in during the night and sowed weeds in the wheat field. Well, usually you don't need anyone, least of all the devil, to do that. Those weeds do a fine job of appearing all on their own. And then there are the instructions after it is clear that the field is infested with weeds to just leave them and let them grow along with the wheat. At harvest, the reapers will deal with them, we're told. Well, that seems to me to be a recipe for disaster. Didn't we hear in the parable of the sower last week that the weeds grow up and strangle the plants? In most of my experience as a weeder, it has always seemed best to root out the weeds early when they first appear so that they don't get all tangled up with whatever it is you are growing. It may cause a little damage to pull them out at this early stage, but nothing compared to the harm they will do in the longer term. Perhaps the difficulty is in the image itself. Two elements, one good and one bad. One is the crop we want to harvest. The other is the useless plants that move in to destroy what is good. Not to say that is not how most of us see the world. Good guys and bad guys, those who are in and those who are out, us and them, the parable and especially Jesus' explanation of it seems to justify us in that way of thinking. If we place ourselves in the parable, I think most of us would see ourselves as wheat rather than weeds. Without much thought, we could probably pretty easily identify who we think are the weeds, nasty sorts of people conniving completely contrary to the good things we are trying to do. We are generally pretty good at identifying those weeds and the ways to root them out. The parable, though, is cautionary. Be careful about how zealous you are in your weeding. It can cause damage. It is not so easy to get rid of the weeds, especially once the crop is growing. It's not just a matter of a pull here and a pull there, although that can give us some satisfaction. The problem is much deeper, literally. The roots of the plants are entangled. They have become so intertwined that it is difficult to separate them. Where does the good stop and the bad start? How do we deal with the weeds without damaging the crop? Jennifer Kaland, in her commentary on this passage, reminds us that in Matthew's Gospel and in the parables of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven usually is set up in contrast to the kingdom of Caesar. Jesus comes announcing the kingdom and its breaking into the world in his life and in his ministry. The kingdom of heaven is not out there somewhere, removed from us. It is incarnate. It is present here and now for people with eyes to see and ears to hear. It is seed planted in a field destined to produce a crop that will feed the world. But the kingdom of heaven is never far from the kingdom of Caesar. In fact, many times it is hard to distinguish them. They are tangled together in the field. Those who understand themselves to be in the kingdom of heaven cannot escape contact with the kingdom of Caesar. Now, there is a real difference, but as we grow, it can be harder and harder to distinguish the two kingdoms. I've thought about this in relation to the many discussions and actions around the persistence of racism in our Canadian context, in the United States, and throughout the world. We have been reminded again that racism is systemic. It goes down deep into who we are, 
what our relationships are and what they have been. It's not simply a matter of one incident here and another there that we can deal with and then everything will be okay. At the risk of mix, mixing the metaphors a bit, of getting rid of a few bad apples and then the rest of the bushel will be fine. Racism, anti-black racism and anti-indigenous racism and racism directed at other groups has been sown in the field along with the gospel of love and justice. Over hundreds of years, the fear and hatred of the other and the threat they may pose to the privilege that comes with being white has entangled itself in the world that we share. People who claimed to be part of the kingdom of heaven, like most of us, have also been shaped by and have lived their lives subject to a different power at work in the world so that it is hard to distinguish one from the other. In fact, they have often insidiously become identified with one another. Think of the residential schools run by the churches in Canada as an example. In the debates around the so-called cancel culture, this entanglement comes to the fore. Getting rid of the most egregious symbols that glorify those who benefited from slavery and other forms of oppression based on race is the right thing to do. The trouble is, as many have pointed out, there is a tangle of wheat and weeds, and it's not easy to untangle it. In ridding ourselves of the symbols of racist oppression, some argue that we are obliterating and ultimately erasing our past and the lessons that need to be learned from it. As in the parable, the first lesson seems to be the importance of recognizing and naming that entanglement. It's interesting to read, and not without a bit of irony, that it is the slaves in the parable who first notice the weeds growing. The slaves who would actually be doing the work and who recognized a weed when they saw it. Those most impacted are those who recognize most clearly as racism enters into the fabric of our way of being. That perspective and perception needs to be brought to all of our reading of history and our understanding of the world in which we live. Recognizing that entanglement will go a long way to begin the untangling and to debunking the myths about the beautiful fields of wheat many of us like to think we are living in. Also, as in the parable, ultimately there does need to be a reckoning. The weeds do need to be removed and destroyed. In saying ultimately, though, we must be cautious not to use this as an excuse to do nothing. The weeds and the wheat have been growing together for a long time. The sense throughout the Gospels is always that the harvest is near. There is an urgency that we have lost over 2,000 years of Christian history. We have become used to the way things are. We have seemingly normalized the racist attitudes and systems that we have created. Now, we're not very comfortable with the language of judgment that we find in this passage and elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, especially on the lips of Jesus. The wailing and gnashing of teeth and burning in the fire, it's brutal and violent. And yet this pushes us to recognize that there is a judgment to come on those powers that dehumanize and oppress others. There is a call in the gospel to repent, to change, to turn around. And we seem to be in another of those moments now where we can do no other and still claim to be part 
of the kingdom of heaven. I'm still a bit uneasy with this parable, but maybe that's a good thing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, who is full of kindness and love, hear our prayers for the world, for one another, and for ourselves. For this congregation of St. Andrews and for the church around the world, that we may be faithful and courageous in the face of all challenges that arise day by day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For mercy, justice, understanding, and peace in relationships between nations, that in this time of anxiety about the future, there will still be generosity for all in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who work in fields and forests, in mines and offices, in hospitals, schools, and shops, we give thanks for those like Ian who have found meaningful work in this time. And we pray for those who cannot find work, that as the economy is reorganized, all who do work will be fairly treated and those seeking work will not lose hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who travel by land, air, and on water, and for those on vacation taking time to explore your creation, that as we recover from the pandemic, we will remember to cherish the earth and treat it wisely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are teachers and students, for schools, colleges, and universities who plan for a new season of learning in challenging times, that creativity and commitment will lead to discoveries about the world you love and the truth rooted in your wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for all those in danger and need, for the sick and the dying, the poor and the oppressed, for those standing up against injustice, and for all still at risk from COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are closest to us, for friendships that have stood the test of many years, and for those who love us enough to tell us the truth about ourselves, that they may know our love and appreciation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all our prayers in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. The Lord be with you. Sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, however dark the night gets, no matter what you have done or left undone, know that you are held by a love like this. The Creator who made you still claims you in covenant love. The Redeemer who died for your sake lives again by the Word of God. The Sustainer of all creation yet breathes courage into your heart. The triune God still abounds in mercy. Serve then with boldness and joy. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.
Hello, my name is Shara and I work with the Children's and Youth Programs at St. Andrews. This summer we decided to invite all families to take up on a challenge every week. The theme for the summer is creation and community. I'm looking forward to hear from the families at St. Andrews and I hope each family takes at least one weekly challenge throughout the summer and also meditate on what is creation and what is community. I hope to hear from you or see your pictures. Bye for now.